Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this August 18th, 2015 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and you can listen to my show every evening on First Amendment Radio from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Today, again, I, I'm going to speak with someone from the Ilamo Ministry. Yesterday, I spoke with Deborah Andrasak. What a story. And uh, I've been covering this for years. Today, I have Bert Krantz on. And Bert uh, has been with the ministry for just about as long as Deborah, <laughs> better part of 40 years, knows the story backwards and forwards uh, of what these people have been through. Uh, and wants to really uh, tell us a little bit more about it today. And I really think it's a story appropriate for the uh, time uh, with the Pope coming here on September 23rd, 2015, an unprecedented visit uh, in, in a country that it supposedly has a separation of church and state. Uh, I believe that's not the truth, and I believe this country has been run by Rome for years. And... Uh, before I get to Bert, let me just make this uh, connection. Uh, when I covered the Alamo ministry, I, 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 I didn't know them from Adam, and I started looking at their, their Christian views and what they did, what they did. I mean, I even years ago had people from their ministry. I sat with them and had lunch, talked with them, knew, knew about uh, a lot of things they do, and to me, it was a setup from uh, word go, how, they, how the federal government uh, wanted to destroy this ministry. And to me, I started wondering why. And then I connected the dots, of course, with the Vatican. So many people, when they talk to me, they go, well, how do you connect the Vatican to this group? And I'm going to let Bert explain that in a minute, but let me, let me uh, uh, bring this up. In fact, if you look back to the time when Ronald Reagan was in, in office, uh, there was some stories coming out uh, about this holy alliance with our government. And uh, this was back in the 1992 Almanac. You will see that there wasn't one uh, organization, one, one Senate group that was subcommittee, the United States and the House of Representatives, governing all these different things that weren't connected to a Roman Catholic senator or congressman. It's amazing. They had control in 92 of things like commerce, communication, medicine, health, education, human services. And you go on and on and on, and then you start picking out the names of these people. I won't do that now because it would take the whole show. <laughs> that, on its face, shows you the Vatican connection to our government and how they operate. I'm not going to get into all the particulars. We've done that for 10 years on this show. But, Bert... Uh, I think people have a hard time understanding when I say that the Vatican was behind the imprisonment of Tony Alamo and the and bringing down your church. Can you explain what you guys know about this? Well, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. First off, Greg, I would really I want to thank you for having me on today. It's very much a pleasure to be here. Uh, gosh, that goes. Uh, way back, Greg, because uh, when you mentioned all the different aspects of control that the Vatican has, you, you, uh, I'm sure you know, but you didn't mention their religious control uh, over uh, the Protestants, over the uh, evangelicals, over what was uh, had broken away from the Catholic Church or the Catholic institution. I don't even like to call it a church. Uh, you know, back during the Reformation, and people had actually tried to break away and become uh, Christians as the Bible uh, says that we should be. And that's when the Jesuits, of course, they started the Jesuit order, and that was to, to mount the Counter-Reformation. And the Counter-Reformation went on successfully, had its ups and downs, but as time went on, uh, the Jesuits got more and more control. As you know, they've had control in the United States uh, way, way back. You know, they kind of had them. <clears throat> well, anyways, uh, and they actually, as you know also, they gained a lot of control into the different Protestant uh, denominations with this ecumenical movement that they started back when Pope John the Twenty Third was Pope. And uh, 
I'm sure they were planning it for many years before that, but they had a very well laid plan to lure all the different religions back into what they might not even call it Catholic by the time they're done. I don't know, but it will be, you know, one world religion. And uh, it really, they don't care if people are Protestants, Presbyterians, Lutherans anymore because they're all the same. They've been ecumenicized or brought into the fold. And this is where the rub comes in, uh, in where uh, the Lord moved upon Tony and Susan Alamo in a very supernatural way where he ordained this ministry in that when they went out into the streets and preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to these hippies, they had such a revival. It was a worldwide revival that uh, it became known as the Jesus Movement. And uh, their doctrine or their teaching, Tony Alamo's doctrine and Tony, Susan Alamo's doctrine and teaching was straight, pure gospel from the Bible. And this does not bode well or doesn't uh, mix or mingle with the one world religion because their idea is to extract God out of religion and turn it into a secular, worldly religion. Whereas, uh, you know, uh, God deals individually with the heart and soul of the individual. And today people are being processed and programmed and uh, propagandized into this cookie cutter mold of becoming a world citizen and to love the world and to save the world. And, you know, I mean, they're uh, just making sure that they don't uh, throw their plastic in the wrong can because they want to save the world and things like this. And as if this is righteousness, Whereas, you know, God is a God of the heart. And Tony and Sue Alamo appealed to the hearts of the people on the street. They went out into the highways and into the hedges, just as the Bible says. And they compelled people to come into the house of the living God. And they preached an individual gospel, a gospel where we are individually responsible before God for our individual actions. It's not like something we're all going to join hands and become one big world and God's going to accept everybody. No, Greg Anthony is going to stand in judgment, Bert Krantz is going to stand in judgment, and everybody else in the world is going to stand in judgment for what they have done in their life. So this, uh, this uh, brings about uh, of course, they preached salvation, that people, that all are born in sin and shaped in iniquity and all need a Savior. That's why Jesus came and had to die. And But he didn't just die. He rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and he's alive today. Now, you preach this gospel, and then a lot of people might think, well, yeah, Jesus did all that so that I can live my life. And when God looks down, he just sees Jesus and I can hide behind Jesus and I can just live my life. But see, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that Jesus didn't come to just bear the cross alone and all the world go free. But there's a cross for everyone. There's a cross for you and me. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. So this gospel kind of flew in the face of uh, the ecumenical gospel that's being uh, indoctrinated into the world today where they call evil good and good evil. And now you've got the Pope advocating uh, evolution, homosexuality, and all the world is following after him. And, the, and this isn't a new thing. This has been, I don't know if you noticed, but I mean, uh, I, Geisenhower was president when I was little. And uh, I didn't pay much attention then, but ever since I started knowing about anything about politics, the president always promises to make things better. But somehow or another, during their term, things get worse. How is that? Well, It always seems to get worse. No matter what happens, everything seems to be on a sliding scale downward. That's correct. And, and even though they promise change and they promise they have all these great slogans, but uh, somehow or another, they keep following this plan. It looks like it's a plan where things are just dragged down into this sewer of corruption, which, as you know, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but the one that formed the Lutheran religion, he's, that was his description of Rome the first time he saw it. And I think I've heard you uh, describe Rome in that way. 
that it's a sewer of corruption. And the Bible proclaims it to be the mother of harlots and abominations on the face of the earth. You know, and it's, it's interesting, if I could bring something up here. When I, was, uh, when I came back from Rome and I started to uh, look into the ecumenical movement, in, in America, I would go to all these churches. I mean, Baptist, it wouldn't, uh, Lutheran, Baptist, you have it. And I would uh, listen to what they would say, the pastors. And then I would try to confront as many as I could after, after the service. And I would ask them these pointed questions about uh, the biblical Reformation. Why don't you preach the Vatican? Why don't I ever hear that? And you would not believe across the board. It was basically one excuse after the other. Oh, they've changed. This is not, and I say, you know. So what I was seeing was this changeover in my own eyes in these Christian churches becoming more uh, basically uh, diluting what the Bible was saying. And then I looked at some at your ministry, and there were several others like it. I remember talking with um, the... uh, uh, she was the great granddaughter of Samuel Morris, who was the, uh, the inventor of the Morris Code and was one of the few patriots back in the day in the 1800s that wrote a book. He went to Rome and, and started to preach to people in America, listen, uh, I'm telling you what this organization is all about. And Samuel Morris's descendants, she still, this was maybe eight to ten years ago, had a small ministry similar to yours in the, in the preaching the gospel, not pulling punches about the Reformation and what the Vatican's really about. And she told me, she said, they have been persecuting us ever since we, they don't forget us, you know. And so I started looking at these small ministries like yours and watching the Alamo ministry grow by hundreds of thousands. I would see the websites that people were uh, basically listening to this message that was talking the truth about what the Reformers talked about. And then I said, well, how does... Where is, is there any sign the Vatican is after groups like this? And I found a quote by John Paul II, and he basically, I'm going to paraphrase this, and it really hit the nail on the head. He said, listen, and I'm paraphrasing, but it basically this was the message. He says, we have now united with all of our brethren, but we are the mother church. We are still the head, but our main goal now is to get rid of all these fringe ministries who speak up against us. And so he was saying it right there. We are targeting Tony Alamo and groups like him. Isn't that amazing? But it goes over over people's heads. They don't, they, oh, no, they've changed. Go ahead. Well, you really hit the nail on the head. That's what I was kind of getting to. Maybe I was going around the bush a little, but uh, that... Tony and Sue's gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they didn't preach Tony and Sue, they preached the word of God. And, the, you know, the Lord says that if you do that, you'll be hated of all men. Now, uh, he says that you'll be persecuted. He says that you'll be dragged into courts. Jesus said this. He said that you'll be brought before magistrates and kings as a testimony against them. And uh, he's he he said that you would suffer persecution. And he said, he even brought out in the ter- parable of the sower how that, uh, you know, the word of God is spread to everyone. And, and the, the Bible even says the heavens declare the glory of God. So that people are really without excuse. But uh, when the gospel is preached, it falls on the different kinds of soil. Some's wayside, you know, many people... It goes in one ear and out the other, so to speak. Satan's right there to take it away. Uh, and then there's the other one that falls on, on stony ground, and they, they receive the word gladly, but they don't have much depth in their... And this is all talking about people's hearts. They don't have much depth in their heart, and when tribulation and persecution arise, they're offended and they fall away, and they, they don't bring forth any fruit there. And then there's those that grow up among thorns, where the cares of the riches of this world and the cares of the things of the world choke the word and it doesn't bring forth any fruit. And then there's one seed that falls upon good ground. And the, the seed that falls upon good ground brings forth much fruit. So that's the, the condition of all the people in the world today. Now, uh, the, 
the devil, who is the power behind the Vatican or the Vatican-led New World Order, because it's really, uh, you know, the Vatican is the head, but they boy, they've got a lot of branches. And these politicians, you see them getting the blame for everything, and they're paid well for get, taking that blame, for taking that heat. And you don't see the Pope taking any heat. They're uh, well shielded. Well, Tony and Sue had this very successful ministry. They're winning thousands, as you said, and hundreds of thousands worldwide, millions of souls worldwide in every country start, you know, really blossoming out. And this is uh, not something that the world church can put up with. They have to get rid of these people. As you know, the... Uh, Jesuit order, I think Loyola said that if you give me a child until they're seven, I'll have them for the rest of their life. So they got these educational programs where they're teaching children from, and now they want to start them even earlier into school so the state, uh, which is really just a branch of the Vatican, can, can indoctrinate these children into, as we were speaking before the show, into a, a whole generation of people that don't even have a clue of their real history or of the the uh, abominations that the Vatican has been behind. So when people are speaking out against these things, it becomes easier uh, to to convince these indoctrinated children that well, these people just must be you know very much off the wall because everybody knows the Pope is good and everybody. And in the meantime, <clears throat> while discrediting them, they have to just get rid of them because so many people believe the word when it's really explained to them and the power of the Holy Spirit comes down and confirms because uh, there's an there's a inbred or inbuilt uh, part of us, our heart, our soul, our, our spirit, the, the Spirit of God registers with us when the truth comes come when you hear the truth you know the truth you know that it's the truth there's something about a person that they know when they hear the truth and uh, they have that opportunity to accept and reject the truth of course you hear that uh, people hear the truth uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ and they immediately start counting the cost they realize well, if I follow the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to lose all my friends. I'll probably lose my position. I might lose my life. I might lose everything in this world. So if people love the world more than they want the kingdom of heaven, then they're going to go with the world and reject the Lord. But if you uh, accept the Lord, he has so much more than this world has to offer. We ha People don't understand the opportunity that we have in these last days to have everything. We, he has everything for us, not only in this world. Yeah, we suffer. Um, Christians suffer persecution. But Tony Alamo today, he's in prison, but he is in heaven. His heart, his soul, his mind, his, he is in, sitting in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. God says if we accept him, if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives us the power to become sons and daughters of the living God. Do you understand? I mean, do people understand what that means to, to actually be able to commune with God? He communes with us like a son, a child, communes with their parents. Okay, so this gospel here, see, it. you can't control a person like that with the power of the state, because if you put a bullet in my heart, you're making my day, man. You're giving me my ticket into the kingdom of heaven, eternal life. So what do I care what you think or, you know, what someone says about what I do? So when people have, have uh, this kind of a experience with God to where they know that they understand the power that's available to them, and what uh, we can really, what God really is giving us, and and the opportunity that we have. There's uh, there's no way that uh, they can be controlled, so they have to be eradicated, and that is really the key to understanding why this ministry is being persecuted. 
Yeah, and you know, yeah. we've got about five minutes in this half hour. In the second half hour, I want to talk about some of your personal experiences and, uh, and you also some of your reflections and your, your understanding of what Tony Lamo is really about and uh, to kind of uh, show you that he's not the man that's depicted in the mainstream press. And that's, that's a story in itself because when, he was, when this final raid came down in 2008, I could not believe how there were over 150 news outlets that had this story right on the tip of their tongues. Uh, then it goes to Oprah Winfrey. I mean, this thing is, uh, and I'm starting to look at the charges, and I'm going, they're, these are so flimsy that the man shouldn't even be in the, in the courthouse. But that's how they operate. They target him. And then the rest of the ministry is going to be dismantled afterwards, which they're trying to do at this, this, at this juncture as well. So, uh, what do, you know, the, the thing is, regarding uh, your situation right now with the, you know, with the Pope coming here, what's your, what's your thoughts about this? And I know Tony would have a lot to say if, if I could speak with him. Why don't you speak in his stead about what you think about this big visit coming up in the 23rd, which is unprecedented, being invited by Congress. I mean, this is incredible to people that understand what this really means. Go ahead. The, uh, I, now, I, I don't follow politics that deeply, but I do, you know, I, I do know that he's coming. I know that he's been, he's going to different cities, to Philadelphia, he's going to come to New York, he's going to address Congress, he's going to pack out millions and millions of people. And uh, Jesus said, beware when all men speak well of you, for that's how they spoke of the false prophets all the way back through history. That's one of the number one signs that a person is a false prophet. And uh, but one thing I would like to address before the break is sure. that, uh, as you mentioned about them dismantling the ministry. Well, years ago they thought they had dismantled the ministry when they got Tony on this tax charge back in the nineties, and they came in and they stole all of our property, like fifty to hundred million dollars worth of property. They took $5 million of stock right out of the store that Tony, uh, that the ministry had in Nashville, Tennessee. Well, they emptied that store out. It was like three floors of $5 million worth of inventory. And Tony had the, the brothers and sisters in Nashville make these great big placards and put them in the window. And you know what they said? They said, naked came I into the world, and naked will I go out of this world the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, I paraphrase that, but he quoted directly right out of the book of Job. And that is really one of the, the uh, key scriptures in the Bible. Uh, the, like the, the main theme of the Bible is to trust God to such a degree that even though he would kill me, I'll trust him. That Job said that, though he slay me, Yet I will trust him. That's the faith that we have in God. That's the faith that Abraham had when he put Isaac upon the altar. He knew that God had promised that Isaac would be the seed through which his uh, posterity would uh, carry on and that the Savior would come through Isaac. So he knew if he went through with this that God would have to raise him from the dead. And, of course, God didn't have him go through that. But that's the faith. That is the faith that people of the Lord have in God. That's, uh, and that is what Tony displayed when they stole everything. And that's what will happen today if they have us, you know, chase us out of the buildings that we're actually living in and we have to go live in caves or camps. Okay, Bert, listen, we're going to take a break. I only got a few seconds. And we'll come back with Bert Krantz on the Investigative Journal. Back in three minutes. Visit crosstheborder.org. C R O S S cross the border dot org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book. The rapture will be canceled. That's cross the border dot org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicholas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the left behind movie 
with actor nicholas cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin if you want true bible prophecy answers get the book the rapture will be cancelled the author exposes the latin rapture origin the seven-year tribulation deception true bible revelation of daniel's 70 weeks the abomination of desolation the restrainer america in the revelation the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the truth about god's chosen people and so much more about bible prophecy this book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events get the book the rapture will be canceled visit crosstheborder.org c-r-o-s-s crosstheborder.org to get your print epub or pdf version of the book the rapture will be canceled that's crosstheborder.org Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this uh, August 18th, 2015 day on our calendar. My guest is Bert Krantz from the Alamo Ministry, and he's been with the ministry for uh, for better part of 40 years, right, Bert? That's correct. And uh, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your experiences at the ministry. Could you tell us a little bit about the history and then a little bit about Tony Alamo, the man that you know? Well, sure, Greg. Uh, I was saved in 1972. I was uh, very much lost into drugs. I mentioned on a former program that I was <clears throat> virtually suicidal. I was just about at the point where I would contemplate suicide. And God, in his mercy, dealt with me very supernaturally and opened my mind and my heart up to understand and know that Jesus Christ, beyond understand and know, to, to see the reality that Jesus Christ is alive, that he did raise from the dead, that he is God, that he knows everything about me, and that uh, I was not on the right side with God, that I needed to repent, and it put me on a search. And that search, uh, over the course of a year, uh, went to, I went to different churches, uh, pastors, priests, uh, I went to Jesus communes, Jesus rallies, all these different things. Now, you were born a Catholic, too, right? I was born a Catholic. I was raised up, you know, I was a a first communion, you know, confirmation. I was an altar boy. I I, uh, went to the parochial schools. But uh, this search led me, uh, the Lord drew me across the country from Massachusetts to Hollywood, California, where I was preached the gospel on Hollywood Boulevard, as I mentioned before. The brothers and sisters were out on the streets, on the highways and hedges, it's called in the Bible, and compelling people to come into the house of the living God that I could hear the gospel preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's really what won my soul. So, uh, but regarding Tony Alamo, uh, his conversion happened in 1964, I believe, when I was like a 13-year-old punk, you might say, that just was totally into myself. And uh, But he had already become a, a success. He'd been in several successful business ventures. He was uh, involved with the uh, American, uh, gosh, I, you know, I, I don't have a list in front of me of the different health organizations he was with, but it was like the founding fathers of of the uh, the gyms that you see in every town nowadays, this, this whole uh, health movement. The, uh, uh, he was uh, an executive vice president with like Silhouette Figure Form International, uh, uh, these different organizations that had uh, they had their own banks they were so successful because they were the first gyms, you know, that were bringing the people, the masses in. Before that, gyms were just places where boxers went, you know, and trained to be. But be, but this brought it out into the public, and they were just 
make it a lot of money. The uh, first 24 hour fitness centers, all that kind of that, stuff. Those type places. In fact, right. uh, I, I don't have a name handy, but uh, the founder of the 24 hour fitness or the, the same man that Tony was involved with then, he just sold that for billions of dollars a few years ago. He owned that, that company. So <clears throat> Tony went from there into uh, promotion. He began, and he, and he came up with the idea of 20 original hits on one album. You remember that? Mm-hmm. He's the one that came up with that. When you started seeing that on television, hearing that on the radio, that was Tony Alamo behind that. And he made so much money that a very good friend of his, H.B. Barnum, he uh, <clears throat> came into the, you know, because they, they would send in cash in envelopes, and he, he would have mail bags full of these orders. And uh, his friend H.B. Barnum, who he was in business with at the time, they, they had their own uh, studio and uh, promotional uh, company, he came in and said, my man, I have always wanted to roll in money. Can I roll in your money? He literally was rolling in money in this, uh, in this room. And Tony made millions of dollars off of that promotion. And uh, he was well known to be the greatest of promoters. His, uh, he actually had this uh, campaign where he really didn't like the idea of this Brian Epstein taking all the money out of America, you know, because he was promoting the Beatles, so he wanted to promote someone bigger than the Beatles. So he got this kid that had talent, and he began this promotion in Cash Board, uh, cash Box, Billboard Magazine, and uh, he started off with a little ad, made it bigger and bigger to where it was a fold-out, like four-page ad, uh, folding out on both sides. Uh, and it was such a um, and he, he never did reveal the kid's name or show a real picture of him, but it just said the next phenomenon. And then I think halfway through the, the campaign, he began to say his name, but they never did show his face. And then he began, you know, recorded him. He began to come out with these hits on him. And the promotion was going so strong that some uh, famous stars wanted to invest, people that had invested in the Beatles, uh, Roderick Crawford, uh, Shirley MacLaine, I think Robert Mitchum was involved, but they wanted to have a meeting in Beverly Hills, and they wanted to uh, invest. And Tony didn't want to have investors involved because he wanted to say he did it all himself. But uh, a friend of his convinced him to go down to this meeting, and when he went down there, all these stars were there, and of course Tony was traveling around with an entourage of uh, six police officers. He had a coiffure. He had, uh, you know, people uh, spraying perfume on him, and uh, chauffeurs, and three like limousines, and motorcycle cops, and this is how they would travel to go to a hot dog stand. You know, they're just to put people on a trip. Or they go to premieres and steal the thunder from the real stars that were in the movie. And uh, so they traveled down to this meeting in this entourage. And the whole entourage, 17 people, I believe it was, went up in, <clears throat> into the meeting. The lawyer was there for the, his lawyer was there, I believe his wife. And these stars were there. And uh, this Jewish attorney was there the, uh, the representing these stars. And they had the promotion from uh, Cashbox and billboard laid out on the wall and he he was like rubbing his hands and said you know this is like an extravaganza this is the greatest promotion i've ever seen and tony's you know wasn't going for this flattery he he wanted to hear what uh, you know he really didn't want to even be there he didn't want to be involved his lawyer talked him into going <clears throat> so they offered him some money uh <clears throat> and uh they were talking about putting it into an escrow and tony's thinking and if I, you know, when I get this, if I get this money, it's not going into no escrow. It's going right into my saddlebags, you know. This is just, and so just as he was about to start haggling with this man over the money, this force came down upon him. And it's like his ears shut off, and he couldn't, and they were just on the second floor on a, a a uh, business street in Beverly Hills and they couldn't hear the sound from the street he couldn't hear anything and he thought and he felt this warm sensation come over him and he heard 
there's a voice and it didn't come into his ears he heard it in every cell of his body and it said I am the Lord thy God stand upon your feet and tell the people in this room that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again or thou shalt surely die and Tony thought well what they got some ventriloquist here you know but how would that uh, put this warm sensation how would they shut off my ears he couldn't figure out what was going on he was trying to rationalize it in his mind and the voice came again and said doubt not and repeated the same phrase tell the people in this room that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again or thou shalt surely die and Tony's immediate reaction was he was going nuts he thought he was going crazy so he thought well that's pretty you know common people to go crazy uh, you know that are brilliant you know uh, that you got Van Gogh cut his ear off you know sent it to his girlfriend and then you know or, uh, you know, a lot of people, it'd be like a feather in your cap, but he didn't want them to call in the guys with the white coats and drag them out, so he wanted to just go check himself in to a place where he could weave some baskets for a while and, you know, and then come out and say, and put that feather in his hat. So he tried to excuse himself, but this force pushed him down on the chair, <laughs> and, and he started to try to negotiate with this force. Look, uh, I'll tell him, God, I'll tell him, you know, but let me write him letters. Let me send him telegrams. Let me call him on the phone. They, you know, these people are going to think I'm nuts and going to drag me away. And God began to pull the breath in and out of his body and started playing with his, like his soul, in and out like, like a, it was a yo-yo. And uh, it, it, Tony just really started to go to pieces. And... Uh, The Lord opened up his mind, and he said, I'll do it, I'll do it, you know. I, I got a little ahead of myself. And so he stood up, and he said, listen, uh, you guys know me. You know I'm not uh, any kind of a religious person, but the Lord's telling me to tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again. <laughs> there I said it, you know. And uh, I could see Robert Mitchum's face right and, now. And God started pulling the soul in and out of him again. And he said, what's the matter, God? At this point, he, you know, he's not caring what he looks like so much. You know, he's, he's, he's realizing, and God opened his mind up to see all these promotions he had done for the American Health Studios, the Silhouette Figure Form International, all the different, uh, uh, the uh, 20 original hits, all, and all these different products that he had worked on. He says, you put your whole heart and soul into all this stuff for nothing. And here you know that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again. That's the best you can do. You stand up, blah, 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 you know. <laughs> and, and the Lord, all of, a, all of a sudden, Tony saw these people as what they really are. You know, just little sweaty people. You know, why do I care what these people think? When God is revealing this, and he's really... He repented before God at that instant. I'm sorry, God. And he, he didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to do. He'd never been to church. But he seen this movie, Elmer Gantry, and he heard, you know, this uh, huckster uh, preacher telling people to repent. So, he, I mean, he got up and he just started just like uh, vehemently telling these people, repent, Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again, you know, and just... Really, and the, the everything started going haywire. Then this lawyer's like backing up, and he's saying, "Get him out of here! He's Michigan, you know, Jake. He's crazy." Mm -hmm. And uh, the Lord like lifted his spirit. That's enough. And and uh, Tony left with the entourage, and he didn't know what to do. But this, uh, his uh, he wasn't really his bodyguard, this big guy that was his chauffeur that kind of acted like he was a bodyguard. Uh, says, man, he starts laughing. Tony, why did you put them on such a trip, man? He <laughs> says, man, didn't you dig the cat? What's wrong? He says, no, you don't understand. That really happened. The Lord came down upon me and told me that. <laughs> you know, everybody just started laughing at him. And he didn't... Uh, they said, okay, let's go. So Tony said, no, I don't want to get into, you know, he didn't want to get in with this uh, whole entourage. He just walked away. And they tried to get him in. He says, look, you know, leave me alone, you know. And Tony was had a very forceful personality and had ways of convincing people that they should do things the way he wanted them to do. 
So uh, he's he's here. I am God. I'm your man. You know what do I do? You you know you made yourself known to me. Now what do I do? And nothing. He didn't hear anything from God. So he started going to churches. And the first one he went to is that big Catholic church on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, I think I know exactly where that's at. Yeah, it's 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 right and not far from Highland. It's mm-hmm. you know it's right there. The great big cathedral. And he went in. There was this priest, and <clears throat> he went. He got there about two in the morning. Excuse me. <coughs> Nun comes to the door when he knocks. Says he wants to uh, give me. I want to talk to the main the main man here. She says, uh, "Well, you can't talk to him. It's two o'clock in the morning." She says, "Listen, sister, God just talked to me. You know, like get him. And, you know." And so she ran off. You know, all scared. And this father Babish came out and. He told t- Tony told him the story of what happened, and he he asked him, "What do I do?" And the priest just told him, "Well, have it in your heart to be baptized." And he said, "What do you mean, have it in my heart? How can I have something in my heart? I didn't even know I had a heart, you know." I, and uh, you know, he saw then that this priest he didn't have any answers, and he began to get books and all these different things, uh, and. Uh, <clears throat> went to a lot of different churches and these different places didn't know the same God that had revealed himself to Tony. They found they had bars in their churches and these churches, uh, you know, are preaching a God that's like a very namby-pamby, wishy-washy God, not like the one that had threatened Tony that he would surely die if he didn't do this. So this is uh, this is the experience that uh, Tony Alamo had when he was saved. I uh, I want to just uh, kind of stop it there and move forward a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. That into the, the this is the motivating force to this day that drives Tony Alamo to do everything that he does, and that is that <clears throat> he was given that commission in 1964. That's the same commission that I signed on to to tell the people in this world that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again, or thou shalt surely die, because that's the commission that everyone has that's uh, that's called to the ministry, is that, you know, so Tony is not about to, uh, having had that experience, and he's had many more, I mean, I could t- just take hours and hours of your time just relating what I understand from what, you know, the experiences that Tony said. And if Tony was to tell you, he could keep you busy for a long time. He's written many, many articles. They're available on our website, uh, alamoministries.com. And you can read really all about these experiences that Tony's had. So uh, Tony was d- dealt with so directly from the Lord, and it put so much fear in his heart that he doesn't care what a government thinks or all the governments of the world think about what he's doing. He fears God much more than he fears all them people. I've heard him express that on your program. Mm-hmm. And this is the truth. His goal is to tell every person on this earth about the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to earth again and that they need to repent. It's the same message Jesus preached. It's a very simple message. And yet this is the message that tears the walls down. It's the message that cro- that divides the Red Sea to where his, Jesus, the Lord's people can go through and then comes back and drowns Pharaoh's army. That's the word of God that has that kind of power. And I know that people think those things are fairy tales and they've been indoctrinated into thinking the world is billions and billions of years old and man, you know, changed from a monkey into, uh, you know, and evolved. And all these things are just like we were talking about. This is what's being just saturated into young children's minds. And that not only that uh, the homosexuality is a... Is a uh, preference that you might have but whatever you might think you can start thinking you're a girl one day but then you might think you know a man might think he's a a girl but then he might think he's a girl that likes girls or you know i mean it's just it's just lunacy the bible says that the whole world is deceived The, the devil has deceived the entire world and that's the place where we're at right now and the way that that's happened is because people have rejected the word of God. 
And uh, so Tony Alamo, I mean, he could have, he could have uh, got off of this Jesus kick a long time ago, you know. But it's not. That's not what it is. It's his life. G uh, God revealed Himself to him, and if, he, and that is, the God, that moves Tony Alamo to do everything that he does. And it's not just some whim, like God, you know, God told me to drown my kids in this bathtub, you know, like the people would like you to think that God's going to tell people to do things crazy like that. The Word and the Spirit agree. God's Word in His Bible, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, are life. He said, my words are life, and they're spirit, and they'll give life. And if, if you believe the Lord Jesus Christ, and you uh, live according to his word, he says, rivers of living water will flow out of you. And that's what's flowed out of Tony Alamo for all these years. That's why he's won so many souls. That's why there's so many hits on his website. That's why so many pieces of his literature have gone to so far on the face of the earth. And so many pastors around the world teach from his doctrine and even universities. Yeah, I was amazed even after they put him in prison. He's been there now for a number of years. Uh, I, checking out the hits on your website, they're still getting, you know, three hundred to four hundred thousand a, a month or a week. A week. A week. A week. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Go, go ahead. Well, that's you know that's just the tip of the iceberg. You're, uh, because this literature, literature is a far more enduring. Uh, medium, of course, than like uh, what we're on now, radio or the internet, or because you know you can switch something on Facebook or wherever, and then you turn it off and walk away. But this literature, you can sit there and study this literature, and you can actually, you know, commit it to, to memory. It's not like a one time went through your ear and you heard it. And and that's that literature has been put out by the millions, multis of millions, hundreds of millions of pieces of this literature have gone out, possibly billions. I mean, uh, in every country. You know, we, Bert, I just had this thought. We've got a couple minutes left, but I know that uh, uh, we left off with that experience that Tony had. And I, I'd like to get you on maybe next week and keep going with this so we could uh, get a better, clear picture of what Tony Alamo is really about from someone who's been with him for 40 to 45 years. And uh, we don't have time to do it in this show, but why don't we pick it up uh, next week sometime and we'll continue on. Uh, because what I want to do, I, you know, many people only get a picture of him from what the mainstream has depicted him. I mean, the way they depict your ministry is is not the way it is, and I can verify that because I checked it out myself, and I would not uh, tell people this if I didn't truly see the facts and talk to the people and see the story and know it from inside and out. And I wanted people to get a clear picture of what he was about, what your ministry was about, but more importantly, how <clears throat> they're using uh, this story to really try and to discourage people from finding Christ, because they say, well, if this hap look what happened to those people. I'm going to shut my mouth and keep quiet and follow the party line. I think that's an important aspect of what they're doing, don't you? Oh, yes, yes. I'll be very happy to, to come on again and, and get deeper into this further in. It, you're exactly right there. It's an intimidation process. Look what happened to Tony Alamo. You want a 175-year sentence? Yeah. Just try it. And just follow the Pope, and you'll be happy. You know <laughs> that kind of uh, that kind of thinking. But that you know, it, it it's a perfect example. Your ministry of how we really do not have freedom of speech and freedom of press in this country. Uh, well, that's long gone. Right, and this is an example. I mean, people really don't understand. You know, one of the interesting things I love the way the uh, the Pope. And this theory, this this Catholicism talk, they they act as if they're they say they're Christians, but if you if you study their uh, the religion, it is not a Christian religion, correct? And and that's very hard to to separate in people's minds because no matter you, uh, people will say, well, if if God's a God, why do Christians do this and do that? And you 
try and tell them, well, those people aren't Christian. They'd say, come on, man. Mm. You know, it's like it's they've been they've been indoctrinated into that's what a Christian is a follower of Christ. Can you imagine Jesus doing the things that you see people doing today? No, of course not. Right. Well, listen, we're we're all out of time, and I really thank you again for coming on. Uh, and let's uh, let's pick it up again uh, next week, okay? I'll I'll give you a buzz, and we'll 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 continue. Thanks again, Bert. You're very welcome, and thank you, Greg. I'm be very happy to come back. All right.